and uh, my mama's house was all the way live. My brother was trapping out the back window of my mama's house, and she didn't even know it. So I knew if I was in that environment, matter of time, because probation, I, everybody knew probation is one foot in prison, one foot out. Like, if you get in an argument at Walmart, you're gone. So I said, I can't be here. Plus, I was used to being on my own, having my own money. Now I have nothing. They took everything. So I found myself homeless. Another part people don't know about me. And this how I discovered my rapping abilities. Didn't even think about it, man. And I was about to lose my mind because I was used to balling. My partners in the hood, they thought I was smoking. This nigga is homely. What? This nigga smoking. Look at his shoes. You know when your shoes get dirty. <laughs> you raggedy. You're the great. He's smoking, man. He out of his mind. So, man, they was talking about me. But I held on to that promise. It was killing me. I held to that. I could have did my little connects, boom, been back on my feet in a week. But I made that promise. And I remember being outside of this homeless shelter in Fourth Ward, man. And a bunch of Mexicans used to be out there. It used to be called a riot center. And, um, and I just would rap and talk about my problems. And I'll be rapping to God and talking about my problems. Rapping to God, talking about what I used to do in the streets. Rapping to God, talking about, you know, he spared my life. And these Mexicans, they used to trip out because I was, bro, I got nothing but meat on my body. I was so skinny back then, bro. And they say, man, this deep voice comes from the skinny dude. They used to say I sound chopped and screwed. Hmm. So I seen they liked it, so I just kept doing it. Almost, almost every day, and they, you know, to one day, uh, this dude pulled up in a Mercedes, a black dude, and I was used to seeing like nice cars pull up with white people and all that getting out, dropping off clothes or giving donations and then leaving. So that wasn't nothing abnormal. But he got out and kind of came up to the crowd of me and these Mexicans, and he was listening. And then he went, he left that and went into the, uh, into the. Uh, the center and left and then this woman who who was a secretary she came outside and said do you know who that is who just left I said no she said that was Kevin Bass from the Houston Astros hmm. he just wrote you a thousand dollar check we don't even know your name that light cut on because I'm from the streets I'm a so hustler I, I can get some money doing this <laughs> there it is I said, man, they really like this this deep voice. I ain't know what a 16 bar was. Like I was throwing out, I was just rapping, but and I took that money, went to Kmart, started buying them little black tapes with all that air in it, and started flipping it, flipping it, flipping it. Gathered money, saved money, man. But you was cause you you were rapping a cappella on these. Straight a cappella on it. I remember, I remember a dude say, nigga, you expect me to pay this? Nigga, ain't even no beat ain't on no this beat. <laughs> <laughs> And he bought it anyway. I was pushing it, boy. And uh, until I ended up, you know, having enough money to get some whack beats and stuff. And uh, uh, Shout out to your first producer. No offense, whoever this brother is. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. It, it's a blessing. Yeah. Everybody, you, all us start out in stages. You producer, so I mean, everybody has stages, so. And uh, man, uh, I ended up saving money, man, and started working on my my, you know, a whole album, whole project. And in between that time, my name grew because all the churches was like, you know, the thing they would ask is he cussing? No, he don't cuss on it. He he mentioning God like, but they were like he's kind of rough though. He's talking about guns and all this stuff. <laughs> So they, but they said, man, we want him to come. So I would show up at these churches, man. I was nervous around these church folks and the little kids and stuff. And it was hard for me not to cuss. Sometimes I was cussing in that. They'd, they'd be like, 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 be up there like, you know, I told them motherfuckers. And I'm like, oh, it's broken. <laughs> church like, like it was hard, man. So, but, you know, the little grandmas in the churches, you know, they just fell in love with me. We like him, you know. The, some of the preachers are like, man, I, I like you, man. You, you real. You can tell you ain't fake with whatever you doing. <laughs> like, so that was encouraging for me to keep going, and my name grew. 
And this is still early too in like Christian hip hop like genre. You know it's like I mean? 90, 90, late ninety four. Yeah. You know yeah. ninety five. It's crazy. I was talking to my boy E yeah. Red on the way over here, and I was telling him I was finna interview you, and he was like, "Man, he said wine though, new wine." Man, when I was a kid, man, he came to Windsor Village. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, still yeah. remember this, man. You come to Windsor Village and, and perform it. You know what I'm saying? And he was in the youth program. That's still sticking up to this day. You know why they remember me? Now, think about it. You church, people got on suits, people speaking polite, and all of a sudden this dude wearing all dicky, Dickies, pants slab, big old afro out, or braided down, and the music is shaking everything. You know, that's... I left an impression because that wasn't happening in the South at all. It wasn't happening in the church community at all. My partner's on the West Coast, Gospel Gangsters. Shout out uh, Solo. He passed away in 2020. Right when we did a project, right after we did a project, he passed away, man. It's called Problem Solve. So if y'all listening, go pick that up. It's uh, New Wine and Solo. Uh, it's called Problem Solved, but they were, they were doing it before me. They ex Crips and Bloods, real ex Crips and Bloods, and they just started rapping, and it was on that street level. And they were the only ones I could relate to because they had Christian hip hop. Them dudes was, excuse it was corny. me, it was, it was corny. corny. It was a little too soft. I didn't, I didn't, I'm like, man, these dudes, you know, uh uh. But them, phew, I knew exactly where they was coming from, their frustrations and how they was talking to God. But I was the only one in the South doing it. And it blew up. And That's what I asked you, is that how you were able to come up? Because it was on a clip on a documentary where they was like, he's a long way from being homeless. And this is like 2001 and they flashed in the crib. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. That boy was moving them units over there with Robert oh. Gilliman, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you even mentioning Robert Gilliman mean you know the business. I know Robert, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah bro. Yeah. Oh, way I was, man, I was such a, let's go back to what we said earlier. Couldn't nobody outwork me. I'm not, I'm not stealing no more. I'm not in the streets. So whatever I did, I told, well, my family know this. In the beginning parts of my career, as I went up so quick and so fast, for five years straight, I only got two and a half hours of sleep a day. No joke, no hype. So I reached in my closet one day to get my shoes and blacked out for nine hours. My body like, all right, nigga, we cutting off on you because you, you going too hard. Somebody find you in there? How you, like? I woke up. My family thought I was gone. My wife was like, I seen your car out there. I guess I thought you got picked up. Or whatever. I'm gone in the closet, you know. And because uh, I was afraid of being back home. I was afraid of my family going in reverse. And I knew this was all I had. Danny Houston. Danny Houston.